On Friday, 5 July, in, uh, India's new finance minister, Nirmala Sitharaman, uh, presented the budget for 2019 and 20 for government of India. We are looking at the defense allocation for 2019-20 uh, made in this budget and what it reveals about the, the nature of modernization, upgradation and other plans and policies that the government has for the armed forces. We have with us Major General Harsha Kakkar who was in the who comes from the artillery regiment of the Indian Army and is one of the most prolific writers on military affairs currently in India. Uh, welcome, sir, to NewsClick. Thank you. Sir, my first question to you. You've seen the budget. Uh, there were something very striking this time about the budget because for the first time the finance minister failed to even give out in her budget speech the quantum of money being allocated for defense and merely talked about and referred to uh, withdrawal of custom duty on import of military equipment and platforms. How do you see that the omission on her part to, to mention the, def the size of the defense budget and the increase that she was proposing uh, for 2019-20? The fact that, it, that she did not mention the, de the term defense or the allocations at all in the budget immediately gave you the confirmation that there is going to be no increase. It is going to remain the same. If there was an increase or decrease, like in all other cases where such incidents, have, I mean, where such changes have taken place, they were part of the main budget speech. Her only remark of cutting off customs duty for imports amounts to about 25,000 crores spread over five years. It's not 25,000 crore in one year. So, so it was evident from the way she went that she's not going to tamper with what was announced in February this year. In any case, this custom duty was introduced in 2016 by, uh, by the previous government of the same party, belonging to the same party, but of the, in the previous Avtar. Right. Now, let's come to the budget the size of the budget because that has also raised a lot of eyebrows. Now, they, there are two components to the budget. One is the defense budget and the other is the defense pension. If you put the two together, it's the amount that has been allocated is rupees 4 lakhs 31,000 crore rupees uh, for year 2019 and 20. If we just take the defense budget minus the pension, it is rupees 3 lakhs and 12,000 crores for uh, the three services, the revenue and capital as well as the civil expenditure of the Ministry of Defense. How do you read the sum which has been allocated both the revenue as well as the capital for the three services? Uh, before I come to the other parts of it, how do you read? The, the, the allocations which have been made for the three services? The allocations overall are as per the, the norms laid down. The Army getting the largest share, then the Air Force and the Navy. As far as the revenue is concerned, it is based on the standing force that we have. The standing force is determined by the threats that we have. Today, we've come down to the concept of no additional increment of manpower so it is save and raise. When we talk of raising the additional commands, which are the cyber, space, or the uh, special forces command, we're looking to cutting down manpower somewhere to be able to create manpower for this. So as we induct technology to some level, we can afford to cut manpower. But there is always a limit to the cuts. The Air Force and the Navy, the Navy especially when it's acquiring new ships, for every ship, you need manpower alongside. 
it cannot cut from one in place in the other. So therefore, it may get difficult for the Navy, similarly for the Air Force. The Army is a place where the Army Chief's present concept of undergoing a complete reorganization or restructuring, where he's looking at cutting down manpower, may possibly be able to support uh, the save and raise. But when you look at the revenue budget, there are some aspects to it which have been missed out somewhere. Over the last two, three years, especially since URI, when the army realized it had drastic shortfall of ammunition and it had to be prepared for a 10-day war or more and it had to create the ammunition, funds from the government were not forthcoming. It cut a large part of its revenue expenditure, including construction of married accommodation projects to divert funds for building up its ammunition stocks. Now, those projects that you cancelled, and if you remember over the last few months or maybe around seven, eight months ago, the army contractors were almost up in arms because their building payments or their construction payments had not been made. Correct. Now, if you have to make those payments and you have to cater for the normal running of the forces, the revenue expenditure is equally essential. This is what we require for our <clears throat> normal maintenance of the forces. Salaries is one part. You've got to maintain your infrastructure. You've got to maintain your weaponry. You've got to maintain your transport fleets. You can, I, can, I, can I interrupt here, sir? What proportion of the revenue expenditure goes towards salary wages and what proportion is allocated for maintenance? The largest portion goes towards salaries and wages, which is the which is where you determine the for the strength of the army. Based on the threats, the government has approved the manpower strength. The army, the army doesn't. Today they are not raising the any more army manpower, but you're raising it of the CAPFs basically because of the revenue expenditure and the pension bill. I'll come to that, sir, because that. That also ties up with what uh, General Bipin Rawat had, uh, has recently stated that the yeah. government has accepted uh, it, the army's restructuring plan including right sizing of the force. I'll come to that. But if we stick just to the budget part of it right now. Now one part of the budget you've explained as deals with the revenue. The other part deals with the capital. Now capital is what where there has been much heart burning amongst the veterans as well as, as, as well as service personnel because that is where we will be know how much money would be available to the various services to buy various equipments and platforms that they require correct okay. now okay. of the total sum that has been allocated capital account of uh, roughly 1 lakh uh, 3,000 crores, uh, 30,000 crores or 3,000 crores, uh, 1 lakh plus uh, crores. Now, it seems that most of the money that has been allocated to the three services, the bulk goes to the Air Force of roughly 39,000 crores, followed by Army of 30, uh, 29,000 crores, and then comes Navy with 23,000 crores allocated for it. But a report today in the Hindu also points out that uh, these allocations have to be to be seen in light of the fact that these are committed liabilities, installments which are due for contracts signed earlier. So Army and Air Force in fact have got a lower allocation than what their committed liabilities apparently happen to be. It's only Army which would have a surplus of roughly about 7,000 odd crores. Uh, to make new purchases. Now, how do you read this situation? Because simultaneously we are talking about Navy acquiring uh, a number of vessels uh, for which orders are going to be placed very soon with the shipyards. Air Force going to acquire very, I mean, I don't know when the when it will be signed, but there is this plan to get 114 fighter jets for which again money would be required for transport planes, money would be required. How do you read this? Sir? What does it mean? Uh, okay, let's look at it in a slightly <coughs> different manner. Go back to last year. We had the same problem last year. 
did anything stop right so what i mean to say is there are shortfalls at the beginning of the financial year we faced it last year we had even a lesser budget where we had the vice chief sarath chand raise the point and publicly go on record to say that we have got no money for our committed liabilities we the army was short of its committed liabilities but what stopped you still modernized you still managed to get money from here and there and you were able to make to at the moment the air force if you look at the figures is short by 9000 by about 7 to 8000 crores approximately the navy is short by about 3000 crores the army like you said is surplus there is going to be some way out between the defense and the finance minister to work out that the deals go through the committed liabilities are done and we make a basic payment like the air force may further delay giving it to the hl the hl may be compelled to take a loan for the time when the payments are made subsequently the same may happen as far as the navy is concerned after all you will most to a, to a large extent be going to our own dockyards the problem comes when we go in for joint ventures joint ventures under the make in india but you are supposed to support the setting up of the industry you are supposed to support r and d the future infantry combat vehicle has been on the cards and every year it is getting pushed away because funds are not there hopefully with nirmala sitaraman having seen both sides <coughs> the budget is on and out definitely she should logically be looking at catering for a reserve which makes slowly get released to the armed forces on an as required basis the moment you announce that it's part of the budget i have got 10000 crores and i'm going to give it to you in your capital you watch the jumping in the three service headquarters for their demands so i have a feeling because the same thing jetly did last year and sarat chand went and i mean it was public outcry it was given out to the uh, uh, to the defense uh, the the member of parliament committee on defense this standing committee on defense i mean it was announced all over and it was it again led to immense discussions across all media channels but everything moved so i still have a feeling i still have faith in the system that the government realizes that we are sitting on a powder keg park is not going down china the trust levels have not come up your nsg deal is not through which implies that they still wish to push you away while we talk peace on one side pak has presently cooled off pushing in kashmir after balakot how long will the threat remain they are under tremendous pressure themselves not only fatf not only imf the fact that they know that we now have our full holding of ammunition they are even scared because they are not in that position so things are changing but a time may come when something happens and you have to go so you've got to be prepared you cannot afford to let another mic 21 come down so the government is going to move how do they create when do they create i would prefer giving nirmala sitaraman some time and i would wait to see the way service headquarters would react in the next few months when one talks about the defense budget and the allocations for defense there is always this complaint that defense allocations have uh, instead of rising they have actually fallen and people talk about the size of the gdp and the percent of gdp that ought to be allocated for defense what is your take on it uh in fact when you look over the years we've been demanding 3% of the gdp in the present context 3% would be asking too much the government has got immense priorities of its own whether it's infrastructure development social needs lifting up the indian population which we cannot let it to be down in terms of defense at the same time i would go back to the words of abdul kalam which he when he spoke in the indian military academy and he said national security and national development go hand to hand without one you can't have the other and without the other you can't have the first when you have development you've got funds for national security when you've got national security funds will flow for national development that's how india has the largest fdi in south asia it's because our institutions are secure 
the nation is secure. So that's how it will flow. In the way the GDP is growing, forgetting about the challenges that we face, because China is more concerned towards the US than India. Park is a major threat. We have no offensive desires anywhere, including in China. So even if we touch 2%, I think we will be very, very well off. Well, we have touched 2% because it's slightly more than so 2% of pensions. pensions. <laughs> well, uh, the, it seems that the figure that has been released, it seems that they come to, if you uh, ex, do not, ex, uh, I mean, just restrict yourself to defense. It's 1.62. No, it's 1 if the revenue, capital and pension is added, then it comes to 2 no. To you take pensions. You see, pensions has never been a part of the same. Well, this it is, is when you want to show a boost in figures, you add pension. No, the pension, this is an accounting practice. It's not a reality. In the actual, okay. actual expense that the country incurs on account of defense is 4,31,000 crores which must include uh, pension because pension is nothing but okay. deferred wage of the military personnel. No, so, it, it is part. See. The second point, sir, that I, uh, your point is well taken that the size, uh, the, 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 uh, the number of, I mean, what percentage of GDP it should be is not such a critical factor. It, whatever is required, uh, at least, the, it should meet the requirements of the of the armed forces. But I want to move away to another point, sir. One of the issues that has been troubling government of India, and it's been this came up during this whole conflict over one rank, one pension, was the size of our salary, wage, and allowance bill, as well as the pension bill of the armed forces, which it is claimed is eating up and uh, reducing revenue, which would otherwise be available for the services to use uh, as and when they require or in the form in which they require to meet their needs. What do you think needs to be done? The government of India, and I mean, Army headquarters has now come out with this plan. Bipin Rawat has said that the four point, uh, four param uh, the, the categories under which Army is looking at restructuring itself, right sizing itself, the government has agreed to, and 100,000 posts, it seems, would get reduced. Exactly over which period I'm not aware of because that has not been provided. But one assumes that it will be between 5 to 10 years at least. It can't be in one year. 100,000. Now in the last decade, we raised 100,000 soldiers to meet our demand for the two special mountain divisions followed by the, the decision to go in for a stri mountain strike corps. Right? for which we raise. Now we are going in for reducing 100,000 numbers. Do you think this is, this is the best way for the military to move or the government to move when it's thinking, when it talks about reducing the salary and pension bill of the armed forces and sees that as the major cause of the shortfall in defense budget? If you look at the, uh, let's start with the 17 core which you were talking about. I don't think we ever got the funds to raise 17 core because you were not looking at creating because you could not afford to create that additional manpower. So today what you are doing is save and raise. You are adjusting forces from one part to the other. In addition, you are cutting down manpower. When you raise the integrated battle groups, it's not going to be the present strength of the formation. It's a realistic requirement in the present operational scenario of a nuclear war. You're looking at speed, you're looking at decisiveness, you're looking at task-based missions. So you're looking for that and which is going to be a reduction in manpower as compared to what is held. <clears throat> Plus you have removed a few formations. You've reduced military farms, you made them zero. There are a number of workshops which you have now removed and you're going to outsource it to the civil. So you're cutting down manpower. Now, as far as 17 core is concerned, in addition to saving your manpower from here, you are readjusting formations, which becomes surplus on account of creation of the battle groups towards Spark. 
So they now get affiliated towards 17th Ward. That is still in progress. There was an odd article on it. I have no idea on the veracity of the truth. But the way things are flowing, it appears to be moving in this direction. So you think it is possible to reduce at least a significant number of of uh, posts from from the army uh, over the next? You see, reducing posts is one part. The second part is to handle your pension bill. Now the army jawan retires from thirty five upwards. Can we look at increasing his age? Because when he retires at 35, his pension is lowest. His responsibility is the highest. Aging parents, growing children. And what is he got? A pension. If he doesn't have anything at home, then he looks at what job? A security guard? That is all that the industry offers him. So can we increase his service without touching on the operational efficiency? Can we trust him to operate for another five, seven, eight years more? But it seems what the what the army is planning, or the, at least the army headquarters is planning, is to go in for a younger force, reduce and go in for more short service uh, uh, duration. No, that's a different. Part. Okay, no, that's a different. But I'm I'm looking at the jawan. Now let me come down to officers. If you want to give a career to the permanent cadre, then you have to logically have a higher support cadre, which is a short service, and a smaller permanent cadre. Now that ratio of ours is skewed today. Now to get a longer support, sorry, to get a larger support cadre, you have to give them the incentive to serve. And then an opportunity to, to move on. Now, today the industry wants people with 8 to 10 years of service. He does 8 years or 9 years in the army, does a 6 month or a 1 year course at one of the IIMs, and he will be gobbled by the industry because of his experience background, because of his management background. That is the cadre which is served at your requirement. Goes into a second career with a lump sum of money, not part of the pension bill. <laughs> Those who will now remain in service and continue going up will be a smaller permanent cadre who will have better chances of promotion, less chances of being overlooked. So you feel that this is a workable proposition and this will. It is, it's been tried in different forms earlier. The question is, we have never been able to market it. We have never been able to convince the industry. Today, those who are leaving after eight, eight to ten years of service and doing a course in one of the IIMs have a far better chance of being picked up than those who have gone through the regular service and are now looking for a job. So it's the same IIM, same course. One, the last question which I have is linked to my first question. Nirmala Sitaraman began by announcing withdrawal of custom duty on import uh, of military equipment by the services, right? And that was supposed to be a big benefit to the defense by around roughly rupees 5,000 crores annually. But she didn't say anything about excise duty and GST that has also been imposed on many of the purchases that the services have to make. Uh, for some items it's 18 percent, for vehicles for instance it's 24 percent which is exorbitant. Now they haven't taken care of that. My point is both this as well as the custom duty was an indirect way in which the Ministry of Finance would allocate money to the defense and then take back part of the money in form of taxes. So they have done away with custom duty, but they have neither done away with excise duty nor with GST. Now how do you see that? This is being penny wise pound the, foolish. You see what she had announced at that time was that this will help the imports which is what was the intention of India's enhancing its defense needs from external sources. 
And post that, in one of her interviews, she'd also said this will help us in importing our equipment from the U.S. So this possibly is an incentive for the import. So whatever is going to be made in India, that she's going to take her pound of flesh from there. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this time, uh, General. Uh, we look forward to having you with us again uh, on other matters that they, that have to do with the military. But thank you once again for today. Uh, My pleasure. This is all from NewsClick today. Keep watching NewsClick. If you have any feedback, if you have any comment, do let us know.